Hey, this is Barry O'Dell in the After the Stream Stream private Facebook group based on questions that are sent to me from the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring daily Facebook videos. The uh, Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring is our public Facebook page, and this is a this is a private group that I started based on what I do there uh, from questions received during the live stream. Uh, this. This is new, okay? I think this is the second or third video that I've shot in here uh, for this particular group. So I'll do it the same way as I do the public page. If you have any questions or comments, use the comment section. So I was doing my live stream, oh, yesterday, the day before, something. And I got a question from a viewer about, um, well, i tell you what, it was yesterday. It was based off of the live stream from Matthew chapter 7. Based off of, we were talking about doing the Lord's will, Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, and that the people who are going to heaven are those who do the Father's will, specifically Matthew 7, verse 21. And so I, as I was doing that live stream, a viewer sent me a question asking um, what, I can't remember the exact wording, I should have pulled it up here, but anyway, basically, what is something that um, the denominations fail to do every Sunday that we should do. And um, if you're familiar with the Bible, if you're familiar with the uh, Churches of Christ, we know the typical answer to that question is weekly observance of the Lord's Supper or communion, however you want to say that. It's called both things in the uh, pages of the New Testament. And so that's what we're going to talk about for just a bit today. And uh, I, I see I've only got one one who is on here live. This obviously will continue to remain in this group even after the stream is over. But as I said, oh, as always, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to, to put that in the comment section here. Um, where to start? That, so there, there are a lot of distinguishing characteristics of the churches of Christ. Uh, obviously, you know, some of the most common that we could talk about is instrumental music and the fact that uh, the churches of Christ do not worship with instrumental music uh, we could talk about the uh, discussion of baptism for the remission of sins. Most of your mainline denominations do not teach that it is necessary to be baptized in order to be saved. Um, we could talk about the organizational structure of the Churches of Christ, how a, a scripturally organized congregation of the Lord's people will have elders and deacons. That's how the church was uh, structurally set up in the pages of the New Testament. But this question here that I was sent, that I'm going to deal with here on the weekly observance of the Lord's Supper. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at a couple of things, and, and like I said the other day on this video, I don't know how long these videos are going to last. Um, I try to usually go 15, uh, 20 to 25 minutes. We'll just see how it goes. I've got some folks joining on. Hey, Miss Louise, Lyle, and Jean. Good to see you all on here today. I'm going to start in Acts chapter 20. Now, we are very well aware of the establishment of the Lord's Supper as recorded in Matthew 26, Mark 14, and Luke chapter 22. Established during the celebration, actually after Jesus and his disciples had finished eating um, the Passover meal, it's when Jesus established the Lord's Supper. We're familiar with those texts. Now, John, uh, John's gospel does not record those events, but it would be somewhere in John chapters 13 and 14, probably somewhere in John chapter 13. <clears throat> Excuse me. So how did we get to observing the Lord's Supper every first day of the week? That's the question. I think the best passage to go to, and we're going to look at a few passages, but I think the best passage to go to to answer this particular question and to be able to answer it um, accurately with a biblical precedent, because that's what we want to do. The fact of the matter is this. You will not find a verse in the Bible that says, Thou shalt... Eat of the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine every Sunday. There's not a verse that says that. So if you're looking for a direct command, a specifically stated command of what to do, in that sense, like I just said, you're not going to find it. But what we do have is precedent that has been set by the, uh, by the uh, example that we find in the pages of the New Testament. So here in Acts chapter 20, we have Paul. If you go back into Acts chapter... Oh, let me see here. Okay, the, the end of Acts chapter 18. 
Paul begins his third missionary journey. You get into Acts chapter 19, he goes to Ephesus. And uh, there's a riot that breaks out at Ephesus. We read about that in the last part of Acts, uh, Acts chapter 19. And it's when we get to Acts chapter 20, where Paul leaves Ephesus after that riot. This is where we read, uh, this is what we're reading about today. Acts 20, beginning in verse 1. After the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. Here's what we often do. Why do you celebrate the Lord's Supper every Sunday? Well, because Acts 20 and verse 7. And, you know, I guess technically that's a correct answer, Acts 20 and verse 7. But I think it's good to read the things around it, not just that one verse. So we know what's going on. Now when he had gone over that region, Acts 20 and verse 2, and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece and stayed three months. And when the Jews plotted against him as he was about to, uh, to sail to Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. And Sopater of Berea accompanied him to Asia. Also Aristarchus and uh, Secundus of the Thessalonians and Gaius of Derby and Timothy and Tychicus and Trophimus of Asia. These men going ahead waited for us. Now you'll notice it says us here at Troas, but we sailed away from Philippi. So Luke is with Paul at this point. Uh, you have what's called the we sections of the book of Acts, where we learn that Luke and, and Paul spent a lot of time together. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days joined them at Troas, where we stayed seven days. So that's Acts 20, verses 1 through 6. Paul is on his way somewhere. And the interesting thing is, <clears throat> when you look at Acts chapter 18, verse 21, Acts chapter 19 and verse 21, Paul is in a hurry to get to Jerusalem so he can be there for Pentecost. But when he gets to Troas, the Bible tells us that he waited for seven days. He's in a hurry. But when he gets somewhere, he waits there for seven days. Why is that? Then, now is where you have Acts 20 and verse 7. Now, on the first of the week, if you, and if you pay attention, if you look at your Bible, you have a King James, New King James. Um, <clears throat> those are the main Bibles that I use in my personal study. You will notice that the word day is in italics, which means it was supplied by the translators. So it says this. Now, on the first of the week, well, we know what that is. It's the first, the, the Greek actually says the, uh, the uh, let me see, miaton sabaton, the first of seven, the first of the week. We know what that is, Sunday. Then we have this phrase, when the disciples came together. Came together is in the passive voice. In other words, they were brought together. They didn't just decide one day, hey, let's get together on the first day of the week. They were brought together to break bread. And the to break bread is the purpose of, of their having come together. To break bread, Paul, uh, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. Upon the first of the week, they came together for the stated purpose of breaking bread. Now, if this were just a common meal, Paul wouldn't have had to wait seven days for the disciples to come together. Again, that phrase, to come together, is in the passive voice, which means they were, it was not them who decided to do it. They were called together for a specific purpose, and that stated purpose is to break bread on the first of the week. Of course, you know, the, the discussion often goes, well, every week has a first day. That is true. And he waited seven days so he could be there with them for the stated purpose of to break bread. I want to share something with you. I shared this link in the group. I'm going to play a little bit of audio here for you. And um, just listen. And if you didn't listen to it in the group, this will help you here. It's only one minute long, so I'm going to share it, and uh, then we'll come back. We as Methodists don't necessarily have communion every Sunday. We might in some churches, but in general we don't. Why? That goes back to our roots. As Methodist clergy, in the late 1700s, when the denomination first got started, a pastor could administer communion at baptism was on the circuit, traveling around. They might be going to 12 different places. They may be going to 20 or 30 different churches on their circuit, which means they couldn't be in church every Sunday. The pastor always gave communion when he got to a church. He might get to that church once a month, maybe once every two months. 
we were used to that. And then as our pastors went on shorter and shorter circuits to ultimately serving just one or two or maybe three churches, that habit has just stayed with us. Our communion happens maybe once a month in some churches. In some places, it's maybe three or four times a year. And it's just part of our history. Okay, so you heard what was said there. That was um, from umc.org about the United Methodist Church. And it's just part of their tradition. It's part of, as he said, part of our roots, part of where we came from, from pastors uh, traveling on a circuit. And they might not get to a church every Sunday. They might get there once a month. And so that's when they did um, the Lord's Supper. It was interesting to me that the guy was, you know, that he admitted, well, this is, you know, this is just how we do it. Um, so a year or two ago, I began studying with a young couple here at Mammoth Spring, <clears throat> and uh, they, one of the reasons they were looking for a church is because where they had been going offered Lord's Supper, I forget, it wasn't every week, but when the husband asked the preacher, why, why don't you do this every Sunday, he said, because this is the way we've always done it. Now that was the Baptist denomination. Now this we hear from the United Methodist denomination. That's a con- this is a common practice among denominations to not observe the Lord's Supper, the breaking of the bread, as the New Testament puts it, every first of the week, as we have here in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. Remember now from Acts 20, Paul is in a hurry to get to Jerusalem so he can be there for Pentecost, but he waits seven days in Troas so he can be with the disciples on the first day of the week for the stated purpose of to break bread. That is the precedent that we have set in the pages of the New Testament. Now, another interesting thing to do is to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Um, Beginning in verse 17, Paul talks about um, how they had abused the Lord's Supper and uh, become selfish and, and immature. And there's a phrase that reappears in 1 Corinthians 11 several times. Um, verse, 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen, 17, you come together. 1 Corinthians eleven eighteen, 18, when you come together as the church. Verse 20, when you come together in one place. Uh, verse 33, when you come together. Verse 34, lest you come together. Well, the, so you have that phrase repeated five times from, from 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen 17 to verse 34, they came together. Now, we know that the disciples came together upon the first day of the week, the first of every week. Paul's talking about the observance of the Lord's Supper. In fact, there in 1 Corinthians 11, you read verses uh, 23 through 25, he reiterates what the Lord said when when he established it on uh, with his disciples uh, after the Passover feast, again recorded in the Gospel accounts. This is why churches of Christ observe the Lord's Supper every Sunday. It's not a church of Christ... uh, How do I say this? It's not a Church of Christ tradition like we just heard about the United Methodist Church tradition. It had nothing to do with circuit preachers. Um, It's not a Church of Christ doctrine. We hear that a lot. Uh, That's a Church of Christ teaching, isn't it? That's a Church of Christ thing. No, this is a biblical thing. So we have the witness of Scripture. We have the precedent set for us. We have Acts 20. We have 1 Corinthians 11, the disciples coming together. You know, another passage we could look at is um, in terms of them coming together. is 1 Corinthians 16. The disciples came together upon the first day of the week to, uh, in that particular text, talking about the contribution, a special contribution for the poor saints in Judea. We know, we're repeatedly told in the New Testament that that was the um, practice of the first century church. But let's leave Scripture out of it for just a minute. I want to share something with you. I've got a 38-volume set of books called, um, well, the the Anti-Nicene Fathers. In other words, these are church writers who existed before, who lived before the Council of Nicaea, which took uh, took place in 325 A.D. Okay, um, we we call them the Church Fathers because they're historians. They wrote, um, they quote a lot of scripture. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of quotes directly from scripture. So Lyle says, I guess that rules out Saturday night for convenience. Absolutely. And Lyle, by the way, you can search, you can Google it. Just do a search, um, communion on Saturday night, and you'll find a lot, of, a lot of churches that uh, that offer that. Um, what's his name? Wayne Jackson, ChristianCourier.com, has three or four very good articles on what we're talking about right now. 
ChristianCourier.com. So let me let me share this with you from the Anti-Nicene Fathers. Uh, this is Volume 1, and this writing that I'm going to read to you is done by a man named Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr lived from 110 A.D. to 165. He is right there, not many years after John the Apostle died at the end of the first century. This is not insignificant. I know it's not the Bible, but history testifies to what we're talking about here, too. So this is just, it's called the First Apology of Justin. In other words, this is his defense of Christianity. Um, so just listen to what he says here. He says, And afterwards we continually remind each other of these things, and the wealthy among us help the needy, and we always keep together, and for all things wherewith we are supplied. We bless the Maker of all through His uh, Son, Jesus Christ, and through the Holy Ghost. And on the day called Sunday, all who live in cities or in the country came together, uh, all who live in the cities or in the country gather together to one place, and the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read as long as time permits. Then when the reader has ceased, the president verbally instructs and exhorts to the imitation of these good things. Now, the, when he uses that word president, in other words, um, this would be a man who was presiding over the, uh, I guess you'd say the services, kind of keeping things in order. Let's see. Okay. Then we all rise together and pray, and, as we before said, when our prayer is ended, bread and wine and water are brought, and the president in like manner offers prayers and thanksgivings according to, the, to his ability. And the people assent, saying, Amen. Amen. And there's a, there is a distribution to each, and a participation of that over which thanks have been given. And to those who are absent, a portion is sent by the deacons. And they who are well to do and willing give each, uh, give as each thinks fit. And what is called, uh, and what is collected, is deposited with the president, who succors the orphans and widows, and those who through sickness or any other cause are in want, and those who are in bonds, and the strangers sojourning among us. And in a word, takes care of all who are in need. Then he says this. But Sunday is the day on which we all hold our common assembly because it is the first day on which God, having wrought a change in the darkness and matter, made the world. And Jesus Christ, our Savior, on the same day rose from the dead, for he was crucified on the day before that of Saturn, Saturday, and on the day after that of Saturn, which is the day of the sun, having appeared to his apostles and disciples, he taught them these things which we have submitted to you also for your consideration." So you have a, a testimony from a person who lived in the second century <clears throat> that the disciples regularly met on the first day of the week, the day of the sun, as he calls it, for the purpose of taking of the unleavened bread, and he's, as he called it, the wine and the water. They would often dilute the wine with water. You have the testimony of Scripture, and you have the testimony of history. And again, I understand what I just read to you is not inspired by the Holy Spirit, but it is a historical writing testifying to what we're talking about. Why do we partake of the Lord's Supper every Sunday? Because, Scripture, <laughs> because of Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, because of 1 Corinthians 11 and 1 Corinthians 16, um, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10 refers to the Lord's Day. The Lord's Day is the day on which He was resurrected from the dead. Uh, Sunday, the first day of the week, was the day upon which the... Um, the church was established there at Pentecost. These are the reasons. This isn't just tradition. It's, it's, again, it's not like this Methodist video said, well, you know, this, this comes from our roots, and this is just how we did it, and this is why we continue to do it. That's not good enough. That's not good enough. We have to know why we do what we do, why we believe what we believe. It's, it's like Colossians 3.17 says, Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. We have to have God's authority for what we do. That's the answer to that question. Most of your mainline denominations do not observe the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. And I've got two that I know. Their answer would be to why not. They would say, well, because that's, that's our tradition. That's just how our church does it. Let me tell you something. If you're a member of the Church of Christ, the Lord's Church, you need to be able to answer this question. You need to be able to give a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, 1 Peter 3 uh, and verse 15. 
So yes, Lyle, Saturday night is ruled out. It was left for us an exa- left for us as an example, as you said there. God does not leave us in the dark. Okay, he, he doesn't. Oh, y'all figure it out for yourselves. When it comes to worship, he's never done that. I mean, you go all the way back to Cain and Abel. Remember after Cain was angry and killed his brother? Well, I guess it was before he killed his brother. But God said, uh, why are you so angry and why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, you'll be accepted. Man, that same thing's true today. If you do well, if you do what's right, God will accept what you're doing. But it has to be based on Scripture. Either a command, and like I said, there is no command in the New Testament that says, um, hey, you have to do this every Sunday. But we have the precedent set in Scripture by the practice of the early church, and we also have the witness of uninspired history. And, and by the way, Justin Martyr is not the only one that spoke of their weekly first day of the week meeting and their observance of the uh, uh, unleavened bread and fruit of the vine. There are quite a few who actually testify to that. All right, I hope that answers your question. And uh, I'm going to tag the person who asked this question so they'll be able to see this video. I don't know that they are on here right now, but I don't have anything else. This is what this group is for, guys. Um, Questions and answers. Like I said, it's a private group. If you have friends, you can invite them to this group. I'm the moderator, so if I see an invitation, um, I'll let them in, and they can see the content here. All right, thanks for being here. Have a good day, and I don't know when the next video will be, but I will see you there at that time.